Our Father, we thank you for this session again of gathering before you to study the Bible. We thank you because in the Word there is life, there is spirit, and there is the water of life, the bread of life for everyone. And we're asking that this very day, as we will open the pages of the scriptures to us, you will open our eyes of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Guide us with your gentle hand, with the Holy Ghost, into the depths of your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Affect our hearts with the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. We're continuing with our study of the Acts of Apostles, and we're now reading chapter 6, verses 2 to 10. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, Look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and he chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. We're introducing the study on spiritual gifts as a result of what we have read in Acts chapter 6. Much of the church or the majority of people in the church are ignorant about spiritual gifts, the operations of the spiritual gifts, the distribution of the spiritual gifts, the manifestation of the Spirit through the spiritual gifts, as well as the administration through the spiritual gifts. And because of this ignorance concerning spiritual gifts, which affects the church in its growth, we're spending some time to examine the Word of God concerning the gifts of the Spirit. I read to you last week from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now that signifies that spiritual gifts are so important to every member of the church and to the church as a corporate body as well as to the leadership within the church that the apostle was calling upon the Corinthian Christians that they would not be ignorant of spiritual gifts. Yet I want you to remember that the church at Corinth, they enjoyed the benefit of spiritual gifts. Paul the apostle was not writing to people who had never seen the manifestation of the power of God in various ways and in great dimensions. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. Let me read from verse 5. That in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance 
and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift. Notice that the Corinthian church, they were already having an abundance of the Spirit of God in a great measure was the distribution of the gifts of the Spirit in the assembly that when the Corinthian church was compared with any other church founded by any other apostle and in which any apostle had ministered the apostle Paul said ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ now and yet he wrote to them that they, he did not want them to be ignorant. One point is very clear. A church may experience in a great measure the power of the Holy Ghost. A church may experience the manifestation of the Spirit of God. A church may profit by the outpouring of the Holy Ghost until the gifts are commonly manifested and yet they could be ignorant. Now, if the Corinthian church could still remain ignorant of the gifts, then the average church today that has never seen the manifestation of the operation of the gifts of the Spirit distributed abundantly in the congregation and manifested openly, the average church today is very, very ignorant. Now, you may think, in our church here, we have seen the power of God. The invisible one has made himself visible as we have seen miracles, healings, deliverances. But we have not seen anything up to the measure that they saw in the Corinthian church. And if the Corinthian church stood in the danger of ignorance... I can see also that we stand in the danger of ignorance concerning spiritual gifts. The aspect we're looking at today is the relationship, the link, between the use of spiritual gifts in the church and the growth of that church. Come back to Acts chapter 6. In verse 1, and in those days, the number of the disciples was multiplied. Look at verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. In verse 1, we have disciples. In verse 7, we have disciples. In verse 1, we have multiplied. In verse 7, we have multiplied. But then there is a word that makes verse 7 distinct, different from verse 1. And it is the word greatly. In verse 1, there was the multiplication of the disciples. In verse 7... The disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. That is church growth. The church had grown as a result of finding out which of the members are full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, and they are people of honest report, members within that church. Finding them out assigning them responsibility and expanding the network of administration service within the body as a result of that the church grew when each member of the local church functions as God has ordained in the church that church will grow as all members of the church walk in the spirit and they work with spiritual gifts, the church will be warm in fellowship and outsiders will be won into the fellowship. 
a spiritual gift is a supernatural capacity or power bestowed on the Christians and the church by the Holy Ghost to enable them to exercise normal, regular, expected functions as members of the body of Christ. You want to understand that a spiritual gift is not given to anyone for personal benefit or profit, but it is given to profit the whole congregation, the, the whole local assembly. Now, the type of ignorance we have in the church, and uh, no doubt we have in this church as well, one, many, many people feel that the spiritual gifts, even though they are valid for today, they are important for today, they are important only in the apostles. And there are many churches today that believe that the spiritual gifts were made for the apostles. The apostles received them. They manifested them to establish the church in the early period. Once all the apostles have gone away, there is no need for the spiritual gifts today because they feel no ordinary member of the church needs the spiritual gifts. Now, some of us may feel like that. And there may be no desire within us for spiritual gifts. We may feel that the leader of this church, the pastor of the church, will need spiritual gifts. But then, the ordinary members and the ordinary workers will not have the need of spiritual gifts. And so there is no desire there is um, no praying for age because we're just ordinary members of the church. Other people have felt that those that are having special responsibility in the church, like evangelists, who are supposed to reach out to the unknown or to the regions beyond, and they are to go to the heathen lands and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. They need the sign gifts, the spiritual gifts, to make the word of God confirmed in the hearts of the pagans and the heathens. Now, the people having that idea, they will say, they accept that spiritual gifts are necessary if God has chosen you to be an evangelist reaching out to pagans and heathens in faraway lands. And we too may have some ideas like that here. We may feel, I am just an ordinary member in the church, and I love this church, and I am praying for our missionaries who have been sent out to regions beyond. Those who need to know that our God is alive, that Jesus is the Lord. We are praying for those missionaries in African countries so that the people there will see the power of God, they'll bend the knee, they'll bow their hearts, and they will give their lives to the Lord. But then we'll never pray for ourselves to have the spiritual gifts because we feel that ordinary members of the church will not need any of these things. Others in reading Acts chapter 6, they have come to the conclusion that apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers of the word, they need the Holy Ghost. But then, the deacons in the church, others that have responsibility, but may not be up to capacity of the apostle, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, or prophet, that the deacons may need the Holy Ghost in a full measure, demonstrating the spiritual gifts. And so they feel, I am not a zonal leader, neither am I an area leader, neither do I have the responsibility of taking the Bible in my hand, collecting some 10, 20 people together in a house and teaching them the ways of the Lord. And since I am neither leader nor counselor, preacher nor exhorter, 
I do not see the need that I will pray and seek for the Holy Ghost in a great measure to have the spiritual gifts. Again, it's because of ignorance concerning the ways of the Lord and concerning how God works and moves in the church. The spiritual gifts as revealed in the Bible are available to every member of the church. And I want to show you some examples in the Bible of people that were neither pastor nor prophet nor evangelist nor pastor nor teacher nor deacon manifesting the gifts of the Holy Ghost and thereby making visible the power of the invisible God. In Genesis Genesis chapter 41 from verse 25 and Joseph said unto Pharaoh the dream of Pharaoh is one God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good years are seven years. The dream is one, and the seven sin and ill favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of farming. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh what God is about to do. He showeth unto Pharaoh, Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, that's prophecy. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore, let Pharaoh look out, a man is now coming into wisdom. He has given out the knowledge. He has revealed by the gift of revelation, the knowledge, the interpretation of the dream. Now, he is coming to give counsel, advice, supernatural wisdom. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man, discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land. This is now administration. It's gone beyond giving the interpretation of the dream. And it's gone into um, telling them something must be done to provide for the future. And now it's coming into administration on government level. And it says, let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of those years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be forestalled to the land against the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land perish not throughout the farming. Now, Joseph was not an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. 
he was just a prisoner. As he was in the prison, the Lord was with him. Somebody told lies against him, and he was imprisoned unjustly. What do you think about a believer that somebody has lied against and already is in the prison? Now, does he need the gifts of the Spirit? What do you think about a citizen in the land? Does he need the gifts of the Spirit? What do you need by uh, what do you think about a Christian who is working in a factory, who is working in um, in an establishment? Does he need the gifts of the Spirit? Now Joseph was just an ordinary fellow. Nobody counted with him. They didn't count him as anything. But the power, the Spirit of God was upon his life. Pharaoh had a dream that troubled him. And it was a significant dream given to him by God. He did not know the interpretation. Joseph was called. And because of his relationship with God, God gave him the interpretation. He gave it unto Pharaoh. And you can see that the gift of the word of knowledge came out in that interpretation. The gift of the word of wisdom came out in that interpretation. The gift of prophecy came out in that interpretation. And um, he believed that this was of God. In fact, the people believed and it saved the whole of the nation from the famine. If God did it at that time, God can do it today. You may be an ordinary member in the church, but somebody may have a problem. He may be a manager. He may be a pharaoh. He may be an important personality in our land. And you know about it. You are just an ordinary, regular member of the church. But the Spirit of God is upon you. And in your neighborhood, you know about it. And then God uses you to solve a problem for that individual. And it takes um, that individual and people around him away from the calamity that would have happened unto them. Every member of the church needs the spiritual gifts. Uh, Exodus chapter 28. Exodus 28 from verse 2. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Look up at me here. I have known people in the church who become so proud when they have the gifts of the Spirit. And they tell us that they cannot touch any work in the church. They cannot do anything in the church except preaching and praying. Because now they are saved, they are sanctified, they are baptized in the Holy Ghost, they are endued with power, they are endowed with the gifts of the Spirit. All they can do now is preaching, praying, ministering to the needy. But do you know here in the passage I have read to you, God had established the high priest. He needed people that will sew the garment of Aaron, the high priest. And he found out some people, and he filled them with the spirit of God and the spirit of wisdom. And they had that spiritual gift only for one reason. Listen to me, not to preach, not to pray for the sick, but to sew garment. To beautify the high priest. Because God said they will make the holy garments for glory and for beauty. And he said, to do that, I have filled some people with the spirit of wisdom so that 
they may make Aaron's garment. What do you think? That we will say now, all our cleaners in the church, making the church clean, all those who are involved with arranging the flowers around the church, planting grass around the church, planting trees around the church. Come on, get on your knees, seek the face of the Lord, and receive the gifts of the Spirit. And you know, in many places, the members of the church will laugh, and they will say, I am not an evangelist, neither am I a prophet, neither am I going to pray for the sake. All I'm doing is to get some flowers together, arrange in the church, just sew some garments in the church. That's all I do. And do I need the gifts of the Holy Ghost? The Word of God says yes. And in Exodus chapter 31, From verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bazaliel, the son of Uri, the son of all, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. Now, listen to this. This man received a call. In the church, we talk about a call, the call of an evangelist. God has called me to be a great apostle, many people say. God has called me into the ministry of proclaiming the gospel to preach, to prophesy. Now, God called Bazaliel, and he filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom in understanding and in knowledge what was he to do after all why all this noise about the gifts of the word of knowledge and wisdom and understanding and the spirit of god upon basaliel what is his call is he an evangelist is he a prophet look at verse 4 to devise cunning words to work in gold in, in silver and in brass and in the cutting of stones. Have you ever heard of that in the church? That those involved in the building of the church building, cutting stone, molding block, cutting iron, and uh, putting on the wood, and putting on the roof that they need also spiritual gifts. I never heard of that before. Well, this is Bible. That everything you do in the church is spiritual. And the work they were doing, cutting the stone. The work they were doing in carving of timber. That's in verse 5. To work in all manner of workmanship. That is not a carnal work. That is not an unnecessary work. It was an important work. And it needed the Holy Ghost. And needed the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, you know sometimes. When you have people who are working on the church building. Sometimes to have them they are not praying. They are not prayerful. And they do not have the Holy Ghost. In a biblical, scriptural, New Testament measure in their lives. And you challenge them. You say, brother, it looks like you are not praying enough. And, um, you know, the brother may reply, well, if I were a preacher, standing before the congregation by the pulpit, if I knew that I will be preaching on Sunday, of course I will wait upon the Lord and I will receive the Holy Ghost in a great measure. But since everything I am doing, I can do it without the Holy Ghost. And then the brother may just tease you and say, Oh, do you think I need the Holy Ghost for carrying wood, nailing the wood together? and putting on the roof and setting the iron where it ought to be set you know the answer the answer is yes whatever is done in the church whatever is done in the church needs the holy ghost it is power 
in his knowledge, in his wisdom. And so you can see those people have read about to you that God saw it necessary, important, that the work they were to do in the tabernacle, that he'll fill them with the Holy Ghost. Now come on to Numbers chapter 11, verse 14. I am not able to bear all these people alone because it is too heavy for me. This was Moses talking to the Lord. The work was too much for him. He needed other supporting workers. And in verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be officers of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will make, I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and it shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Verse 24. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them they prophesied and did not cease what were they to do exodus chapter 18 these 70 men that god came down and poured an abundant measure of the spirit of god upon what were they doing what was their work Exodus chapter 18, verse 22. Let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee they shall bear the burden with thee they shall bear the burden with thee they were to bear the burden of counseling the burden of settling small matters in the congregation and yet listen to this they needed the holy ghost i am not a preacher are you not an house fellowship leader are you not bearing part of the burden? Are you not having the opportunity sometimes to counsel? In some small matters, in the house fellowship, in the area, in the fellowship, are you not bearing part of the burden? Then the word of God is saying, you need the Holy Ghost, and you also need the gifts of the Spirit. In Second Samuel, I'm reading from verse 23. Second Samuel chapter 23 from verse 1. Now, these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God, the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. And his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Now, the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. What are the Psalms? The Psalms were the songs. And David, by the Spirit, composed 
and sang and played the songs in Israel. Well, you know, I'm just an ordinary member of the choir. And there is not too much that I do. In fact, all the songs are already in the hymn books. It's just a matter of studying the notes with my brain. And um, having some training up my voice. And then singing to the congregation. No doubt I can do that without the Holy Ghost. No, sir. Every work in the church requires the power, the anointing, the infilling the endowment of the Spirit. And, you know, many people do not understand in the church. They sit back, they just lie back, and they relax, and they say, well, all I do in the church I can do without the abundant measure of the Holy Ghost. Now follow me in uh, First Chronicles. Chapter 28. First Chronicles 28, from verse 11. Then David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern of the porch, and of the houses thereof, and of the treasuries thereof, and of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner palace thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat, and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit, by the Spirit of the courts of the law, of the house of the Lord, and all the chambers round about, and of the treasuries of the house of God, and of the treasuries of the dedicated things. What is that? The design, architectural design of the temple to be built in Israel. Was David an architect? Was he not just a king? That's the problem. David yielded himself to the Lord. The Spirit of God came upon him, and he did not count any work in the church, any work in the household of faith, any work among the people of God below his dignity. Uh, you know people that talk about, well, uh, that work in the church is below my dignity. I am called a preacher, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, a prophet. But if they are called to take part in a particular area of the work in the church, they say, well, you call the people that do not have the Holy Ghost to do that. But well, for your information, I have the Holy Ghost. Look up here. It is... Uh, I'm sorry to use this, but I want you to understand as I'm using this uh, language now. Our people tell us that empty barrels make the loudest noise. But you know, when you are full of the Holy Ghost, you realize that every area of the work in the church requires the Holy Ghost. David only needed to design the temple. The courts, the palace, the chambers. He didn't depend upon his natural resources and natural talent. He depended upon the Holy Ghost. And he delivered everything to Solomon. He said, Solomon, look at the design. I got it by the Spirit. And so we talk to the architects, to the designers, to those who are working with the building. You need the Holy Ghost too. And so you understand in the church. The work of the church is so important. And every area of the work needs the Holy Ghost, the gifts in an abundant measure. Because of our time, I'll just tell you without reading to you. Daniel was not a pastor in charge of a congregation. He was just working regularly in the court with Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that troubled him. And he needed comfort, sympathy, love, kindness, as well as interpretation of his dream. And he looked for everybody that could help, nobody could help, to counsel, to interpret, to comfort. 
In fact, the king Nebuchadnezzar became so unhappy that he felt he will kill all the astrologers, all the magicians, all the sorcerers in the land because they couldn't help him. And Daniel said, Why is the word from the king so much in a haste? Give us some time. And he waited upon the Lord, and the Lord gave the prophetic word. And he interpreted by the gifts of the Spirit the dream of the king. And it saved the lives of many people in Babylon. You remember the story of Belshazzar? Mene, Mene, Tekel, Euphosim. That was almost like speaking in tongues. Because it was the language written down, written upon the wall, but there was no interpretation. And it made the knees of the king to knock together because there was no interpretation. They could see it, they could read it, they could pronounce it, and it all sounded like unknown tongues to them. Until the queen came to the king and said, there is a man in this kingdom. He is not a pastor. He is not an evangelist. He is not recognized in Babylon officially as a prophet. Neither was he officially recognized as a teacher. But he knew the spirit of God was upon him. He was a worker within the kingdom administratively. And he called him. And he said, now Daniel, I have heard about you. That the excellent spirit of God is upon you. Can you help me to interpret this? I'll give you gifts. And Daniel said, hold on to your gifts. Spiritual gifts are not meant to enrich the man, the woman that God is using. It's not meant to bring money, riches, wealth to, to anyone. It's for the profit of the people of God. And uh, Daniel interpreted. Now, Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, verse 25. And this is the writing which was, that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Euphosin. This is the interpretation of the sin. Mene, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Peres, that's the plural of you for sin. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now you can see in this interpretation, God was giving Daniel a bit of God's knowledge concerning the unknown. And so you can see their interpretation. You can also see there the gift of the word of knowledge. And you can see prophetic utterance. And so with all this that I have said, I told you I'll slowly go through these things. So that you will realize that members of the church need the gifts of the spirit. For several reasons. The manifestation of the gifts of the spirit are in the church. One, it's to manifest the power of God so that men may be confronted by the reality of the invisible God. When the gifts are manifested, the invisible God becomes visible to the people. They, sudden, they suddenly realize God is still existing. Our God is not dead. He is alive and we can see the manifestation of his power. Israel had forgotten about their God. They were worshipping Baal. And at that time, anybody could have come to give a theological message to the children of Israel and interpret the Bible to them. But that was not the thing. They were worshipping Baal and there were so many prophets of Baal. Elijah came. Not with message, not with preaching, he came with power. And the Apostle Paul said, The gospel is not just in word only, but it's in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And Elijah said, The God that brings fire from heaven, that is the God. And he collected all the prophets of Baal together. 
they shouted, they cried, they prayed, they, they caught themselves. There was no fire. At the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah called them together. And he repaired the altar of the Lord. And he looked up to heaven and he said, God, let these people know that you are still there. And the fire came down. And the whole nation, listen to me, not because of preaching, because of power. Not because of the message, but because of the manifestation of the gift of the Spirit. The whole nation, they bended the knee, they bowed before the Lord and they said, The Lord God is God. And they turned their hearts and their faces toward the God of Israel. When the gifts are manifested in the church, the invisible God becomes visible in the hearts and the minds of the people. Number two, it is to aid in carrying out the great commission. Uh, do you know that sometimes we feel that if we can go with the sound doctrine without the power, the gift, the spirit, we feel the people be converted. But you understand that anywhere the power of God is moving, it is easy for people to give their lives to the Lord because the people of the world say, show me when I see, I will believe. And Thomas was not the only one in that category of unbelief. Except I see with my eyes, I will not believe. You can preach all you want to. You can argue all you want to. You can declare it all you want to. Show me, I'll believe. And there are many people like that in the world. And when they see a miracle, when they see the power of God, when they see the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit, they surrender to the Lord. And so, the manifestation of the gifts, they aid, they support in carrying out the Great Commission. It also edifies the church. It builds up the church. Listen to me. You may be full of the Bible, quotations of the Bible. There are churches where they know the Bible, the Word of God in the head. And they can set the doctrine in order, line upon line, precept upon precept. But if that word is not coming out with the fire of the Holy Ghost, with the power of the Spirit, with the gifts of the Spirit, the witches and the wizards may still be troubling the people, and Satan may still be oppressing the people. But let the gifts of the Holy Ghost, in an abundant measure, be upon the pastor, the teachers, the, the zonal leaders, the area leaders, the house fellowship leaders, and all the members of the church, and the devil will be running away from that church. Because when the Holy Ghost is there in his power, the devil cannot stay around. That's why Jesus said upon this rock, I build my church and the very gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. Because the fire of the Holy Ghost will be burning. And if the devil or the demons or the evil spirits or the familiar spirits come near, they realize the heat of the Spirit of God and they have to go back. And so, the gifts of the Holy Ghost in the church, they edify and they build up in the church. And then, it effects the deliverance of God's people. Look up here. In the early church, they had their difficulties. They had the message, but then they had the difficulties, the persecution. How many times have you read in the Acts of the Apostles that they held on to the apostles and they imprisoned them? Listen to me. Every time they went into prison, either an angel will come from heaven or an earthquake will happen or something will take place because of the manifestation of the power of God. In Acts chapter 5, Peter was in prison. An angel came by night and tapped him and he said rise up and go back into that same temple and start preaching that's by the power of the holy ghost and in acts chapter 12 peter was taken again he was in the prison and the people were praying and they were praying not the ordinary prayer anybody can pray 
Many people are praying in very many places, having night vigil. I'm talking about praying with the spiritual gifts, with the power of God in your life. And as they were praying, again, God sent his heavenly guests and messengers, and they took Peter out of the prison. And he came out of that prison, and the hope of the Jews was disappointed, again, by the gifts of the Spirit. Paul and Silas had been ministering, but they laid hands on them, and they were imprisoned again, and they were singing. My brother, that's not ordinary singing. That's not ordinary singing. That is singing with the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, that's why I'm slowly going through this scene. Woman, listen to me. You have difficulty in your house. The devil is raging. And the devil is making that house to be a prison for you. And you're a member of this church. And I'm talking to you about the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And you are cooking in the kitchen. Or you are washing plates in the kitchen. Or you are taking your baths in the kitchen. And even though the fire is on, the persecution is on. Even though the devil is making use of your husband or your mother-in-law. Or the devil is making use of your maid in the house. And the trouble is at its height. And you just start while you are taking your bath, while you are washing the plates, while you are cooking, you start singing. I don't mean ordinary singing. I don't mean the singing with tears. I don't mean the singing of regret. I mean the singing of the Holy Ghost. And you are singing. And the devil starts running away. Not until you come to Bagada here. But if the Holy Ghost in abundance is upon you, the Lord is telling you that you can chase the devil away from your family. And it may be in your place of work, they are threatening you. But the Holy Ghost is upon you. And all you do is not the, it's not the crying, it's not the rolling on the ground. I'm talking about the gifts of the Holy Ghost upon your life. And you start singing. And you start singing. And the foundations of the devil will begin to shake. And all your enemies will be converted and be, they even become your friends. You know, the old foundation of the prison was shaking. And all that Paul and Silas were doing, they were just singing in the Holy Ghost. Just singing in the Holy Ghost. In the night season. And in your night of affliction, the Holy Ghost can take over when you begin to sing. And the prison doors were open. Everyone's bands were loose. And the, pre the, um, uh, the, the Philippian jailer wanted to kill himself. And Paul said, don't kill yourself, we're all here. And the man said, listen to me. Paul had not preached. Paul had not witnessed. Paul had not taught any Bible verse. The man came trembling, kneeling down, saying, Men, what shall I do to be saved? How many times have you been preaching? Nobody got saved. How many times have you been witnessing? Nobody got saved. How many times have you been saying now, oh, Our church is a good church, and they, nobody, nobody came with you, but when you have the Holy Ghost, and the power of the Holy Ghost, and the gifts of the Spirit, and only your singing will perform a miracle. And then they will be asking you without your preaching, How can I know God? How can I give my life to the Lord? And they directed and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Listen to me here. They didn't run out of the prison. I'm telling you, when a man has the Holy Ghost, the boldness of the Spirit will be upon his life. He'll not be running away. Uh, do you know some of our members who have run away from Lagos because of the austerity, because of there is no work, because they have given them quick notice? Let me ask you, if they had the Holy Ghost, abundant measure, and the gifts of the Holy Ghost, will they run away like that, run to the village? They know there is no gospel church in the village. They know there is no continuation of Bible study in the village. Yet they ran away. They were running for their lives. Lest hunger will kill them in Lagos. But you know when you have the Holy Ghost, you'll not be running. They stayed there until the Holy Ghost came to, went to work in the hearts of the men that imprisoned them. And they said to them, and they said, you know, tell Paul and Silas, we're not imprisoning them anymore. Let them go out of our prison. They can go now. You know what Paul Paul said, Paul said, I'm sorry, tell them I'm not getting out of this prison. Have you ever seen that? 
He said, they imprisoned us in, in a, the public and they want to tell us to go away privately. You go and tell them that I, Paul, the apostle, I tell them I'm not in a hurry to get out of the prison. I am here. If they want me to get out of this place, let them come on their own. I will not receive the message from a sergeant or messenger. And the people came, they were afraid, they were begging them. We are sorry, our prison is not for you. You can go. I'm talking about every member of the church having the Holy Ghost. And you know when you have the Holy Ghost in your life, there will be no fear anymore. Your life is saved. Anywhere you go, the Holy Ghost will just be walking in marvelous ways. I know that some of you are looking at the paper you have on your hand and you are saying that, well, all right, you look at your wristwatch, you look at the paper, you match them together, you say, we are very sorry tonight. If you are sorry, I'm sorry for you. The Holy Ghost doesn't just follow what is written on the paper. The Holy Ghost is interested in getting you to be empowered, endowed, endued with the power of God so that you will never be a coward in your life anymore in the name of Jesus. I can go through everything on the outline and you remain a coward. I can go through everything on the outline and you just remain like you are having the knowledge in your head without the power, without the anointing, without the gifts in your life. I'm not interested in just giving you the theory. I want to bring you into the power of God. Listen to me, 1974. You know, we started 1975, 1973. But in 1974, there was a sister that I knew myself. She had been in a particular house, living there. And as she was in this house, we were teaching on the Holy Ghost. We had been teaching on that Holy Ghost before we even started Deeper Christian Life Ministry. 1972, at the University of Lagos. And um, we will call those people together Saturday night from 10 o'clock in the night. Sometimes we go through till 3 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes till 3, uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. And we touch them step by step on how they will launch into the deeper things of the Lord. And uh, you know, this sister began to pray and she had the Holy Ghost upon her life. And um, it wasn't long after that that a woman in the house called her and said, why you see that we're afraid of you now? Everybody in the house is afraid of you. Please, be very careful. Don't touch us. We will not touch you. That woman had been tormenting everybody in that house. She was a proclaimed, a, a confirmed witch that everybody knew. And she tormented everybody. But this sister, the Holy Ghost upon her life, and that witch in the house came to her and began to fear her. And said, every time I look at your face, I see like the fire. What is burning in your eyes? That's the Holy Ghost. You know, if you remember our history in uh, Lagos, uh, I don't mean deeper life now, but history just in Lagos State. Around 71, 72, 73. There were times that, uh, you know, these people that will just come on the street. You don't see them uh, now. We don't hear about them. They tap you like this and... Um, you, you become to, to unlook us like a goat and you'll be following them. And as you are following them, you'll not know until they take you to a harbor list and they, and they make you to make money. And there was a case that um, a sister, the Holy Ghost was upon her life. We had been teaching them the word of God. And you know, somebody just uh, taught her like that and she started following unknowingly. But after a minute, she just, internally, she couldn't talk, she couldn't say anything, but internally, the Holy Ghost was saying, you are following a strange man. This man is going to take you to make something. Beware, come out. And uh, the, the lady just said, Jesus. And the, and the man that was taking her away just became conscious and started running away and running away and running away and let the sister alone. That's how the sister was delivered. That's what I'm saying, the Holy Ghost. Did you hear 1984 here? That uh, somebody was taken like that from this uh, Bagada church. And they took somebody away. In fact, the people are taking that person and they had gone to the harbor list. They wanted to, make, to use the person to make money. And immediately he got to the harbor list. The people that brought, uh, that took her there, uh, uh, you know, they were there. And uh, the person said, why is it is this type of person you are brought? There is fire all over him. I cannot touch him. Take him away, take him away. He was already there. 
where they wanted to use him to make money. But the Abali said, I cannot touch this one. There is fire all over his body. And he came back. He's, now, he's still a Christian, a child of God. And uh, they, they were not able to use him for money. Now suppose uh, there was nothing on him. Just coming to church. Just coming to church. Just coming to church. Ordinary person just carrying Bible. Ordinary Bible. Ordinary person. He has come to Bagada, go away from Bagada. Our church is good. Our pastor has Holy Ghost and he doesn't have Holy Ghost. And they take him like that. You'll never hear any testimony about him now. That's what I'm telling you. If you are saved, get sanctified. If you are sanctified, get spirit filled. If you are filled in the spirit, keep seeking the Lord. Desire spiritual gifts. Well, I'll be finishing the outline next Monday. Is that all right? The Lord wants you to be full of the Holy Ghost. The Lord wants you to consecrate yourself. When you consecrate yourself, the Lord will be able to pour the Holy Ghost in an abundant measure upon you. Rise up and let us pray. Let God work in your life. The Holy Ghost is not just for the pastor. It's not just for the teacher. It's not just for the coordinator. It's not just for the zonal leader. It's for you.